Cool. So today I will be talking about debugger internals, how they work, when they don't work, why they don't work, and the various factors uh, that affect these things. A uh, little bit of background, I'm Sammy, co-founder of Backtrace, where we are actually building debuggers. Uh, prior to that, a lot of my work has uh, revolved around uh, scalability, performance, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, So we will be talking about symbolic debuggers. Uh, for the folks here that are uh, primarily for native applications, so things that are natively compiled, for folks here who don't use natively compiled applications. Uh, their uh, native applications are used for things like operating systems, databases, anything with uh, stringent performance requirements or interacting with low level hardware. And symbolic debuggers help provide visibility into the state of these applications. Uh, so we'll start off uh, diving into debugger internals and how they work. This is primarily in the context of systems that use Dwarf, so Unix and Unix-like systems primarily, and performance uh, implications there. And then we'll dive into the debugging process and various techniques uh, that could be improved upon with existing symbolic debuggers and techniques you could apply if you're uh, uh, doing any sort of debugging. Uh, so let's dive into debugger internals. So in order to understand symbolic debugging, we first must understand what a program is. So we'll do a brief review of what that is. So this is a very simple C function, which will count the number of Ws in a buffer of n bytes and return the, the sum, the count of, of Ws. Uh, so first step is to compile this down into a, a program. Uh, and into an executable that the underlying uh, operating system and CPU will understand. Uh, the, the generated executable contains various sections that tell the kernel how it should be loaded uh, into memory and eventually executed. Uh, so on Unix and Unix like systems, this is generally ELF for the executable uh, and linking format. Uh, and you have various sections in here, such as ELF header, which has some metadata as to what the entry point of the program is, type, et cetera, et cetera. Program header table, which gives you details on how the program should be loaded into memory, uh, various permissioning details, et cetera. And a whole bunch of other sections which contain you know, ac the actual executable code. Uh, the source code ends up getting compiled into executable code that interacts with memory and a limited set of registers. Uh, so you don't really have a notion of a type or, or anything in there. You're just dealing with registers and memory. Uh, so over here, when we com compile this program down into assembly, uh, the color coding corresponds to the various uh, regions of the C code. It's, it won't necessarily be a one-to-one -one mapping. Things can be optimized out. Things will be moved around, as you see here. Uh, the responsibility of a symbolic debugger is mapping the state of registers and memory back to a backtrace with things like variables, type information, uh, and so forth. And here's just an example of uh, you know, debugger output. So how does this happen? It involves a lot of, of magic. Let's walk through this process. Uh, so the first step is to extract the register state uh, of the uh, process. And this is typically done via uh, some facility provided by the kernel. So ptrace is uh, what would be used uh, for user space applications. And it's available in various broken ways on BSDs, Linux, and especially broken on, on Mac OS. Uh, What's important here is the BRIP register, tell, at least on x86 AMD64, tells us the currently executing instruction in a program. Uh, so once that is extracted, we can use the kernel. So in the case of uh, FreeBSD, ptrace uh, has a subcommand, which will give you the VMA entries, the memory mappings of uh, the program. Uh, and using BRIP, you're able to determine which file uh, contains the executable code uh, uh, that is currently being executed. It could be in a shared library, it could be in the main executable, etc. 
uh, with that, uh, we can leverage the debug information that is available in the file or the set file ca that contains this executable code has a reference to a standalone debug file. Uh, what's of particular relevance for us are these four sections. So you have debug line, which maps memory addresses to line numbers, debug info, which is the bulk of the debug information. It contains type, variable, function information, debug frame and A-frame, which are used for call stack unwinding and exception unwinding for languages like C++. Uh, the contents of these uh, uh, sections are defined by the dwarf standard. Uh, debug line, for example, uh, has uh, in dwarf, you have a, a line state machine and executing debug line is a sequence of operations on the state machine, which ultimately ends up expanding into a giant matrix mapping memory addresses back to uh, source info, line number file. Uh, so for example, over here, you have instructions saying, you know, set the current PC value to this particular address. Next stop, don't advance address, but set the line number uh, to from seven to eight, et cetera, et cetera. And this ends up getting expanded into something like this. Uh, this is where a lot of debuggers do actually end up spending a bulk of their time. Uh, no lazy evaluation is done uh, on this information. So if you're generating a call stack uh, on you know, something like Chrome, uh, a lot of time will be spent here. Then you have debug frame or A-frame. This is uh, similar to debug line. You have this state machine and uh, ultimately this expands into uh, a matrix that tells you uh, what the various values of CPU registers are as you unwind the call stack. It tells you how, how to unwind the call stack. So for example, over here, it tells us that if you are at this location, the caller's frame address is at the memory location pointed to by RSP plus eight, and then the values for the register RBX, RBP, R12 are undefined, and the value of RA is contained in CFA minus eight. Uh, and then this gets to be RSP. And then last but not least, you have uh, debug info. So debug info is where the meat, most of the meat is. It tells you how the program is structured. It contains type information, variable info, compilation units, etc. And this information is expressed as uh, a tree. Uh, and you have debug information entities uh, which have relationships to each other. So for example, in our program, the tree would sort of look like this for uh, at least a WC.C compilation unit. So we have a die entry here with a bunch of children. Uh, the die entry here is for a compilation unit. The name of the compilation unit is wc.c. There's some additional information uh, around uh, the instruction pointer ranges for this compilation unit. And then you have a function called count with a bunch of information, which I did include here for brevity. Count is a function that has an argument buffer. It uh, contains a variable called sum, whose type is uh, a Type def called size t, whose type is a base type uh, that is an unsigned 8 byte integer. In addition to this, debug info also tells you how the va values of variables can be retrieved. So, Dwarf was designed to be uh, generic, it's designed for aggressive compiler optimizations, all sorts of different programming languages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And for that reason, you have a lot of complexity uh, around dwarf location uh, expressions in dwarf expressions. Uh, so for example, in our source code here, let's rewind a little bit. Uh, we're going to look at the debug information for extracting the value of i uh, from the generated executable. Similar to the other uh, to debug frame and, and debug line, you have uh, a stack machine and that is used to express the values of, of variables. So over here, what's being expressed is if we are, if the instruction pointer is between these addresses, then push the literal zero onto the dwarf expression stack, and then the top of the expression stack contains the actual value of the var variable. So it's nowhere in memory, it's not in a register, the value in this case is 
contained within uh, the debug information. Uh, it gets more involved at other addresses. Uh, this is because, in, in this case, the, the variable is actually optimized out. So over here, the debug info is actually instructing the debugger to extract the value, <coughs> the value in RDI plus zero and push that in the expression stack. Extract the value of RDX plus zero, push that on the expression, expression stack. Subtract the two, add the constant 4096, and now the top of the stack has a value of I. Uh, so dwarf is actually Turing complete. It's uh, it can be very involved, and unfortunately, you also have you do have a lot of vendor specific extensions, GNU specific extensions, etc. Uh, so, given the expressive power of dwarf, how come my debugger sucks? How come variable values get optimized out, or are missing, or are incorrect? Frames are missing. There are you know many bugs where threads will be disappearing from underneath you. Uh, so let's, let's explore the reasons for this. Uh, so one aspect that's very important is debug information quality. There is a big disparity uh, in debug information quality, for example, between GC and Clang. Uh, this is also true of Clang 4 as well. So over here we have a simple, uh, we have a comparison of the number of successfully extracted, correctly resolved variables in uh, a test case program with optimizations, without optimizations, and then a compilation of node. And you're able to see this huge disparity between the two compilers. Uh, and unfortunately today when people select compilers, you know, they, they primarily focus on availability, correctness, compilation speed, uh, the performance of the generated code. But one thing that is often neglected is debug information quality. And th this doesn't really correlate with the types of optimizations that are being performed by your compiler. Just because things are supposedly optimized out does not mean that your, your compiler is doing magical, uh, magical things. It really is about debug info uh, generation. And in the case of Clang in particular, the debug generator does not uh, uh, cooperate with the optimizer. There's sort of, uh, there's minimal to no interaction between the two. And this can lead to a lot of funky things. So for example, over here we have a simple program that will loop uh, until uh, uint64 max and repeatedly store the, uh, loop, the ca uh, loop counter variable into VRAC. We're using uh, a macro here just to prevent the compiler from optimizing things out. Uh, and, and then we pause, this will never get executed. Obviously over here. So if we request, uh, you know, if, if we have a symbolic debugger actually extract the values there, GC will actually do the right thing. Uh, in the case of Clang, uh, not only do you have missing values, but you also have incorrect values, uh, which is even worse. And in, and in this case, we are purposefully disabling the optimizer, uh, uh, designing the optimizer from completely eliminating the loop. The values are all in memory. These are things that can be expressed by dwarf. And you know, you could, if you're familiar with assembly, you could pop open your debugger and, and get to the relevant variables. Uh, there are also cases where certain language features uh, simply aren't supported by your compiler. So uh, this test was done on Clang 3.8. Uh, and support for example, packed, uh, for bit fields is uh, non-existent for uh, client debug info when optimizations are enabled. Uh, so over here we have a simple program. We have the bit field. We set apple to one, orange to two, tomato to three. Form a volatile load of x. In this case, we're just disabling the optimizer from doing anything weird. And the program is paused. And again, we do other things to ensure that it's not being optimized out. Uh, Again, GCC will do the right thing here. In the case of Clang, it'll be missing. So if, if you are using enums, uh, if you're using uh, bit fields uh, and other classes of language features, don't just assume things are actually optimized out. It's more likely than not that um, you can dig those values out, especially if you're using uh, Clang. Uh, <clears throat> and then inlining and tail call optimization can lead to all sorts of interesting uh, 
things. So over here we have a uh, tail recursive implementation of factorial. And what we do is pause once n is decremented to one and generate a snapshot of the program. So at this point in time, you would expect AC to contain the value of six and n to contain the value one, right? Uh, now under uh, both GC and Clang, uh, suffer here. So GC just returns a completely bogus value for AC, even n over here where uh, if n equals one, th this is correct for GC, but it's completely bogus for Clang. Uh, these, these types of uh, things are fairly common if uh, you have things like uh, common block hoisting, code elimination, etc. cetera. Uh, just something to be wary of uh, in, uh, in line code. Another factor is some, if you're not using C or C++, uh, using some other language, uh, Another thing to consider is uh, just lack of uh, high quality support for dwarf. So this is uh, Golang. Over here we request a trace for the program at this point in time. These variables have not even uh, been instantiated at this time. They should not even be visible. This is something that can be expressed by dwarf, yet these are expressed with bogus values. And generally speaking, Golang does not have uh, any real form of debug info scoping. Uh, so this is something to be wary of. Uh, or variable value scoping. Uh, obviously there are cases where things do actually get optimized out. Uh, one, uh, for example, one of the tasks of the compiler is to make sure that uh, registers, CPU registers are being uh, used effectively. So CPU registers are significantly faster than memory, but there tends to be a few of them. The register allocator has to determine what should be in those registers when, and it is responsible for determining how and when things should be spilled to memory or filled from memory. Uh, so over here we have a simple program. We're using this volatile load again to avoid uh, ARG getting optimized out. We execute pause. We see that the compiler does optimize these things out. Uh, however, if we have the load of args after pause, we see that uh, things are the relevant uh, region of memory in which we have a dependency is actually uh, reachable. Uh, the reason for that is uh, ultimately the platform ABI determines which registers have to be saved across function calls. So for example, the compiler may determine that it's not worth the cost of saving a register, loading a register, from, from memory uh, uh, from, to and from a register uh, in the case of volatile registers. And uh, in this case, uh, arg would be contained in a volatile register. So in the first example, when things are optimized out, there is no dependency the compiler determines since the value is not being used at this point in time, why bother loading and uh, loading, uh, filling and uh, spilling and filling from memory, Spill spilling and filling that value from memory. Uh, so, an another thing to consider here as well is unwinding personality. There's a little footnote in the dwarf specification which allows the compiler to define the default behavior of undefined values in, uh, during the unwinding process. So if you recall earlier, I pulled up a slide here. I'll just pull it up again, take a reference. Uh, it is. The, the values contained in these variables are, can actually be, the default values, if undefined, uh, can be uh, defined on a per compiler basis. So Clang, for example, strictly adheres to this dwarf specification and these are uh, strictly unknown values. So if you open up uh, a program in GDB versus LLDB, you'll see in many cases more registers are available in GDB. And the reason for that in GC, uh, they've defined undefined as inheriting the previous value of the register. So for example, at, you know, at if the value of RBX was defined in the previous frame and then it is undefined in the following frame, it's inherited in that following frame. And there are all sorts of interesting quirks here. What is interesting is more likely than not that behavior does yield uh, correct values. So there is some information loss by adhering strictly to the dwarf specification. Uh, 
Uh, now, there are also uh, optimizations which are mutually exclusive with having an accurate call stack. So basic block common and, uh, commenting and tail call optimizations like what we saw in the tail recursive factorial function are uh, common culprits. Uh, this is a particularly interesting example. So you have this function f. If you pass 1 to f function, terrible naming for an example, function function is then called with, with the argument a. If uh, f is called with the value 2, function function is called with the argument b. Now what's interesting, and this is common to both uh, uh, GC and Clang, uh, regardless of what argument is passed, uh, the unwinding information just due to the optimizations that are performed are unable to disambiguate whether FA or FB uh, is, is a code path. So in both cases, regardless of whether you pa pass FA or FB, the debug info will resolve to uh, line 21. Uh, also, unfortunately, a, a common pitfall. There are certain optimizations uh, that you could disable to avoid this uh, issue. Uh, so you have F, uh, an optimized sibling calls, and a uh, family, whole family of uh, options here. But obviously, there may be performance implications. Uh, so yeah, we at this point we've examined sort of the. You got a very uh, brief tour of the internals of a debugger and what's involved there and some common pitfalls as far as debug information quality is concerned. Uh, so let's dive into uh, another factor in this debugger. This is debugger performance. So there are three primary factors that impact the performance of the debugger. So the footprint and complexity of the debug information, the number of threads, and uh, the number of memory mappings. Uh, the number of memory mappings is not as relevant for FreeBSD, but for example, on platforms like Linux, uh, extracting uh, the VMA entries for a threaded program actually has n square complexity with respect to the number of thread stacks. So if you have a program with 100,000 memory maps, it may literally take 20 minutes plus just to extract uh, memory map info. Uh, so here's a comparison of uh, GDB and LDB. Uh, I'll have to look up the version info here. I believe it's 3.8. Uh, of GDB versus LDB on uh, Firefox, over 1.3 gigs of Dwarf. Uh, GDB is significantly faster, higher memory usage. LDB, you know, one of the goals of LDB is to be a you know, high performance next generation debugger. That's still not the case right now. Uh, you do have this large disparity. And then this is us, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> and then this is GDB and LDB on uh, Google Chrome, where you have 2.6 gigs worth of uh, debug info. <coughs> and you see a really significant disparity between LDB and, and GDB here. Debug index or GDB index? Sorry? Uh, you're using a GDB index or no? GDB? Index. No. Oh. A GDB index has a negligible impact. impact on this. Yeah. I'm sorry, I missed what you're actually doing with the debugger. That's a good, good point. <laughs> I never said that. So all we're doing here is extracting the back threads and for uh, the thread that we've attached to. Uh, now, obviously, this can be you know, if, if you're using a symbolic debugger during development, this can be a pain in the ass. Every time you iterate, you have to relo reload the debug info. It takes forever. Uh, There's also a pain in the ass if you have a debugger in your post-mortem uh, processing life cycle. So if you get a crash, and then you have to analyze either the process or the core dump to bring the system back up, so you get some form of aggregation, this also becomes a critical issue. Uh, we have, you know, I brought up the, uh, 20 minute backtrace, we have customers where GDB was taking them 20 minutes plus to generate a simple backtrace. Uh, so unfortunately, there is no viable workaround work for uh, large static executables if using GDB or LDB. If you do have a dynamically linked executable and a bulk of the complexity is in libraries that are of not particular relevance to you, 
you could set this option in GDB uh, to turn off automatic loading of uh, shared objects and you can just whitelist the shared objects that are relevant to you. So for example, if you're linked to Qt and you don't really care to poke into the internals of Qt, uh, this would help you and you can just whitelist the executable objects that you do care about. Uh, and you can use Shard to do this. Uh, and then, yeah, so as I mentioned, memory app info is not really relevant, and unfortunately you can't do anything about uh, thread attached performance on uh, FreeBSD. All right, so let's dive into the debugging process and inefficiencies associated with the debugging process and you know, sort of tips and tricks that can be applied to root cause more archaic issues such as heap corruption, et cetera. Uh, and dis disambiguating different uh, classes of bugs. Uh, so typically the first step of fault investigation uh, really is framing the problem and disambiguating the type of fault. You know, were we reading from memory? Were we writing to memory? Was this an explicit assertion, etc.? cetera? Uh, this is still a manual process. Typically what a, a developer will do is jump to source code and see what the relevant line of source code is or check signal info. Uh, neither GDB or LDB really provide good visibility here. Uh, I believe since GDB 7, you do have the SIG info field, which can give you detailed uh, signal information, uh, which helps things. Uh, if you have, let's say, SIG info set, you'll obviously get a lot more context, uh, such as a faulting address, reason, etc. The definition of a faulting address is ambiguous, at least on uh, x86. Uh, in some cases, it could be the value of the instruction pointer. In other cases, it'll be regions of uh, the region of memory that was being accessed at the time of uh, fault. Another thing that's not disambiguated here is also the direction. You know, if it's a memory operation, whether you're reading or or writing to memory. Uh, on Mac OS, Windows, and Solaris, this is done. Uh, so typically you have to look at the source code or assembly to, to do this. Uh, another hairy class of bug are alignment issues. Uh, for most engineers, uh, it's, you know, unless you're familiar with underlying ISA, it's indistinguishable from uh, on x86 from an invalid memory access in many cases. So I've seen cases where people have hit alignment issues and spend a week plus trying to root cause the problem thinking it was heat corruption or something like that. So that's another thing to consider is check the instruction on x86, uh, comp exchange 16b, any move DQA and any instruction that begins with a P are suspect. So if you see something like that, look at the instruction manual and ensure that you're meeting the alignment requirements on those platforms. Uh, another common problem is call stack smashing. So if the call stack is smashed, uh, it's difficult. Well, you can't really unwind the, the stack um, at this point. So this is a program. If the stack is smashed, you'll be lucky to retrieve anything. Uh, you could apply some heuristics here. So assuming that the stack pointer variable is sane, uh, you could manually crawl this call stack and look for anything that looks like a, a, a pointer to a, a function or executable code. So we're, we're using info symbol, we have RSP, and we're just jumping through the stack, scanning for anything that looks like a symbol. So in this case, we went from a call stack that simply consisted of only function B to uh, function B called by function A, called by scenario invalid rightful. Uh, this issue is, uh, this uh, manual stack scanning heuristic is more likely to succeed in the presence of F, F no omit frame pointer because you will have uh, return addresses pushed to memory. Uh, Clang uh, has a really cool feature called safe stack, uh, which uses separate regions of memory to avoid this form of stack corruption, at least for certain functions which it deems uh, to be more likely to, to be uh, at risk for stall, stack corruption. Uh, 
probably the most insidious form of bug in, in natively compiled applications, or applications of manual memory management involve uh, heap corruption. So misuse of uh, memory allocation, APIs, and bugs in, involving managing the life cycle of dynamically allocated objects. Uh, the reason they're very annoying is in many cases, the crash itself can be deferred. The crash could uh, be triggered in a completely unrelated piece of uh, code, uh, et cetera. And uh, especially, this is especially true of FreeBSD where jmalloc is being used. jmalloc is a terrific allocator, but it is, uh, it assumes correct usage of its, uh, of the malloc API. And if you misuse it, it's sort of your problem. Uh, due to this, faults, uh, heap corruption issues tend to be deferred, especially on something like uh, JE malloc. TC malloc is also very similar. Linux's PT malloc tends to be uh, uh, a lot more strict as far as heap management is concerned. Uh, you know, more at least for classic things like double free, etc., you will get a fault uh, almost, well, synchronously most of the time. Uh, so it, it's um, the other big problem here is it's very difficult to disintegrate these classes of bugs. So typically you would use memory analysis tools or like Valgrind or things like address sanitizer to detect memory errors. But if, if you're encountering this issue in production or if you have a performance con constrained system, uh, these tools are not really options. The, now, if, if you, if the, the problem space can be greatly reduced if you understood which variables were associated with the fault and you had introspection to memory allocator state. So uh, there is uh, open source tooling available for jmalloc that allows you to index uh, all the runtime data structures jmalloc uses to manage uh, allocation regions. So you could use that to detect inconsistencies. So the allocator is responsible for allocating de de allocating memory at runtime. It has uh, metadata in memory in order to be able to, to manage these allocations. And typically when you do encounter heap corruption, you can find inconsistencies in this metadata to get to the root cause uh, or help you in the investigation process. Uh, this is a chart by Jason Evans uh, uh, of jmalloc internals. What's of uh, particular interest uh, to us is a thread cache. So every thread has uh, something that looks like a stack and whenever you allocate or free something it will be pushed to this bounded stack. Eventually it will be purged back for uh, so other threads can allocate from it. Uh, so a very simple thing to do for example in the case of a double free. Uh, so for example this is a uh, here are multiple, well, different cases of a double free. So this is the most naive form of a double free, right? You allocate something and then you free it twice. Uh, you can also have this manifest with realloc where you allocate something, free it, attempt to re realloc it, et cetera. Uh, this can manifest as multiple entries in uh, the thread free list. So if you do have uh, jmalloc debug info, you could just poke into the arena data structure and print the values of the free list for the faulting thread, and you can find uh, duplicate entries, overlapping uh, duplicate regions, overlapping regions, etc. And it can uh, really help narrow down the, the cause of the heap corruption. Uh, another common issue is an invalid free. This is especially true if you're playing container of tricks. Over here we allocate a variable and then we free not the region. Some, you know, some uh, a pointer to uh, uh, point is something which is not managed by malloc directly. Uh, this can also, you can also use things like the thread, ca thread cache to, uh, to look at, uh, uh, to determine that an invalid free occurred. So if you see something in your thread cache and it is not at a region boundary uh, or there are overlapping entries, which is more common for an invalid free, you can be certain that this was a case of an invalid free. Uh, and then there are cases where you could also detect use after freeze simply uh, if you have region info. Uh, so at the end of, the, of this talk, I'll give out a couple of links, a uh, couple 
of years ago, uh, a guy wrote a great paper on heap exploitation in JMalloc, and part of that work involved him developing a bunch of GDB wrappers that I like to poke into the internals of, of JMalloc. Uh, these techniques are also applicable to the FreeBSD uh, kernel. So in the case of UMA, you could use you know, similar approaches, crawl, uh, allocator metadata to detect uh, inconsistencies. So you could detect cross zone freeze, uh, and it's fairly straightforward. Double freeze is, uh, is also a very similar concept. Items appear twice in a zone, or it's in a zone, but marked available for reallocation, allocation by, uh, marked available for allocation, or an invalid free where an item simply does not belong to any slab. Uh, one last thing I want to touch on that is uh, specific to uh, FreeBSD is uh, kernel mini dump, uh, debugging mini dumps is extremely inefficient on uh, FreeBSD up until current. So 12 will include some significant performance optimizations. What we found is uh, on certain customer systems, it would take two minutes up to you know ten minutes plus to open up uh, a mini dump, depending on uh, the number of page table entries. So up until recently, the page table entries were stored in a uh, thousand twenty four wide cache with a thirty two bit hash function. Uh, you had a fair amount of overhead per page address, uh, and obviously this is uh, O N uh, complexity. So if you have many pages, the any uh, any PT lookup would uh, result in a linear scan of, of all PTs with respect to uh, the bucket that it landed in. Uh, so free in FreeBSD 12, you have a bunch of performance improvements that we upstream recently, and there are significant improvements. So for this particular example, I think there's an eight gig mini dump. Uh, there's a UFS panic and you know, the runtime goes from 43 seconds to extract a simple backtrace down to nine seconds. So, uh, another issue that's specific to FreeBSD dumps and uh, in specific KGDB is beyond the top of the call stack, it's unable to identify uh, other trap events. And this can lead to invalid uh, line numbers. Uh, the reason for that, when you traditionally, uh, you know, when you do unwind uh, a call stack, there's no async event like a signal or, you know, a trap, etc. Uh, the rip register will be pointing to the next instruction, and the debugger is able to uh, compensate for that. Uh, unfortunately, KGDB does not disambiguate this. So there are many cases where, uh, if you do have multiple trap frames in a call stack, you will have invalid line number information. Uh, so this this is a change that will also upstream. Uh, we had some folks run into this and it was very confusing. Uh, so let's, uh, let's open this for questions. I covered a lot of material. Uh, I'm happy to go back and cover some material. Again, I think I blasted through it pretty quickly. So here's a bunch of further reading. So Core Analyzer is a, a open source tool that you can run on any core dump and it'll detect heap corruption in core dumps uh, for you. Uh, we have uh, a blog post up uh, with additional details on postmortem uh, memory debugging. Here's a link to SafeStack. If you're interested in learning more about debugger internals, there's a PDF right here. And then we have a little family of uh, test programs out there to detect, uh, to uh, measure the debug uh, information quality of varying uh, compilers. Uh, I'll be diving into a lot more detail as to what the shortcomings of Clang are uh, in comparison to GDB when it comes to debug info quality uh, shortly. And I'll, I'll tweet that out when that's ready. And then I have to plug Backtrace. Uh, Backtrace uh, does a lot of this stuff today already and gets it right. Any, uh, any questions? Uh, so for the debug information read timings, um, I know you said you wouldn't talk about Backtrace, but mm -hmm. uh, 
Is the reason it's so much faster because it does less instead of slurping everything in that's and only looks at what it needs? That's exactly. It's that and uh, for debug info overhead, we have end-to-end uh, -end lazy evaluation down to the sub compilation unit level. And the idea is, yes, you don't need to load all debug information to unwind a call stack. Start from the instruction pointer addresses and only load what is necessary. Uh, so, how well would that technique generalize to a, a full feature general purpose debugger instead of just a bad trace? Uh, it would generally applies to it just fine. Uh, there are other tricks you'd need to play, especially if you're using things like dwarf fission, or you could have debug information that's sprawling across object files. And that's primarily latency hiding tricks. You may need a background thread to you know, start processing uh, some of these references. Uh, so no, it's, uh, it definitely applies. The problem is most of these debuggers have not been designed for end-to-end -end lazy evaluation. And unfortunately, with in C, C++ or any, any of these languages, uh, it's very hairy to implement lazy evaluation if you haven't designed for it. The other piece is just uh, proper data structure decisions. Uh, so line number info tends to be a major bottleneck. These pieces could be lifted into LLDB or, or GDB. We apply similar techniques uh, like lazy evaluation there. So rather than it, analyzing the full matrix, we'll only analyze parts of it. We'll uh, only sort sections of the matrix that are relevant, etc. And other stuff too, as well. So you mentioned that Clang is doing very poorly and seems to be continuing poorly based on the fact that they did much better with four. So how how hopeless is the picture for Clang? And do you, are you aware of anybody trying to make it much better? They claim that debug info quality is extremely important to them. So I don't think. Uh, it's a case that it's not a priority. Uh, I'm, yeah, I wouldn't know how hopeful or hopeless it is. All I know is for the last four years plus, there have been no significant improvements and the debug information quality is poor. Ed may have more insights into the efforts there. I'm happy to share some of these test cases with you afterwards as well, if you want to dig into it further. I don't see an effort working on it, but like Fatal's your telegram is doing nothing now. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> All right, cool. Uh, feel free to grab me, happy to talk offline. Apologies, I think I blasted through the beginning stuff too quickly. So just a couple of reminders here. Um, after this session, well, we like in 10 minutes, maybe. We have uh, a work in progress session. So if you want to stay in, that's always welcome. At 6, so one hour from now, there is a documentation session with Drew, probably. Uh, not in this one, but in this one. And if you don't stay for those three weeks,
uh, tomorrow morning, like uh, Dan said in the morning, there is uh, well, everything starts in the bed. You can show up at night, oh, that's just maybe good, just maybe for see cupcakes, this kind of stuff, but everything starts at that. Enjoy the rest of the night. Good presentation, by the way. <laughs>